Hi, Wendell. Um, you can you can start. Thank you so much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this second seminar for the year of the African Center for Transnational Criminal Justice. And we are happy to have one of our own, uh, Dr. Linda Mushariwa, to share her experiences in terms of the Dominic Onwin case and a uh, Taylor's perspective, a field world approach perspective. And my role is simply just to moderate proceedings. I know Dr. Anza Munyai will also help with the questioning part. She's also part of the ACT CJ Center. And it is then my privilege to hand over to our Dean, Professor Jacques Deval. Please, uh, if you can open the proceedings for us, Prof. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Wendell, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, everybody. Um, it's great to, to see quite a few people have joined. Looking at the participants list, it's also people from quite a few people from outside UWC. Uh, so we're very glad that, that you were able to join us for this virtual uh, conference or this webinar. Um, so just perhaps a, a few words from my side. Uh, you will know that the African Center for Transnational Criminal Justice was established in 2020. And it's really going from strength to strength. Um, John Mark Iji is the director. And we see growing numbers of students, growing numbers of staff, growing numbers of publications coming from the center. So uh, it's really a, becoming a flagship center. And we hope that it's going to, to get stronger and stronger uh, through through the years. In about what to say uh, at, at, at this event, uh, I immediately thought of a former colleague of ours, um, which indicates that UWC actually played quite an important role in establishing the International Criminal Court. I don't know if any of you would remember Meda Tuvela Mira. Uh, but he was originally from Tanzania and he was a colleague of mine when I just joined UWC in 1993. And in the late 1990s, he, he played a very important role early 2000s uh, in establishing the, the, um, the International Criminal Court. He unfortunately and sadly passed away uh, in 2006. Now, Linda, um, I haven't, don't think I've met uh, ever in person because of uh, all the strangeness and the times in which we are still, uh, in a sense, living in. Uh, but we are very lucky to have her. She has a very impressive CV, uh, as you will have seen, and she's working on, on very important uh, stuff. So she's going to talk us to us as Wendell indicated about the Ongwen case. And this is also, of course, a very fascinating case. Many of you will know the case. Um, and um, I, I won't say anything about it, but leave it all to her to, to talk to, to us. So once again, um, welcome and looking forward to this presentation. Back to you, Wendell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. And I would just like before we head over towards the presentation and let Dr. Mushariwa grace us with her presentation. Let me kindly introduce her and read out the short bio of her. Very impressive. So Dr. Mushariwa is a researcher at the African Center for Transnational Criminal Justice currently uh, at UWC. And prior to joining the center, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at the UJ University of Joburg affiliated to the South African Research Chair in International Law. Linda obtained, obtained a PhD degree in law from University of Kuzuru Natal, uh, LLM in International Economic Law from the University of South Africa and uh, LLB from the University of Zimbabwe. She, was previously, she previously worked as a state prosecutor for the government of Zimbabwe. Her research focuses on the African Union and International Criminal Court, the AU's Agenda 2063 framework, the regionalization of international criminal law in Africa, 
women and children's rights, post-colonial theory, transitional justice, and the law and literature. She has published on the immunity question before the ICC, the application of the complementarity principle by the ICC, the deteriorating relationship between AU and its member states and the ICC, and on accountability for sexual exploitation and abuse against women and girls by United Nations peacekeepers for, uh, in uh, conflict situations. In October 2020, she was awarded the University of Johannesburg Postdoctoral Research Excellence Award in recognition of her outstanding outputs and academic citizenship. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishariwa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nokia. Um, firstly, I would like to say thank you to everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this seminar. I do appreciate um, special mention to the Dean. I also want to thank uh, Prof. E for giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. Um, I will share my screen, but I will switch off my camera because my internet connection is not very uh, stable. Um, um, okay. Um, I hope that everyone can see uh, the screen now. Yes, okay. we can, Dr. Mender. Yes? I'm saying, yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, so the title of the paper that I'll present today is The Prosecutor versus Dominic Ongwen Case Before the International Criminal Court, A Trailer's Perspective. So this is um, a work in progress. I'm still working on the paper and um, I do hope to get uh, feedback from the presentation. So the world's first permanent international court, the International Criminal Court was uh, established on the 1st of July, 2002, following ratification of the court's founding treaty the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court by the requisite 60 states parties. So in July of 2022, the court celebrated 20 years of existence. At 20 years, the court has come of age and this calls on us as scholars of international criminal law to reflect on the gains and perceived shortcomings or missed opportunities by the court. In this paper, I explore whether the court has lived up to the expectations that were expressed during the drafting and negotiating stages of um, the Rome Statute, including that the court had to be an effective and truly universal mechanism of justice and accountability. I do this through an evaluation of um, the approach taken by trial chamber nine uh, to the pertinent issues that were raised during the trial of um, the case of the prosecutor, this is Dominic Orwell. I argue from a third world approaches to international law, 12 perspective that the chamber's approach uh, when one considers this apparent disregard of the cultural and religious issues that were raised by Orwell's defense team and uh, to the request by the defense that the chamber considers incorporating traditional justice mechanisms at the sentencing stage is reflective of the Eurocentric nature of international criminal law and international law in general. So TWAIL uh, seeks to show that there is a link between the older forms of domination, particularly colonialism, and the prevailing trends of our contemporary international law. Some of the fundamental aspects of TWAIL are drawn from the critical legal theory, whose main focus is to show that international law concepts are neither natural nor neutral, but that they've been shaped by a history which highlights the reason 
why they are in their present state. So 12 scholars essentially approach international law from a critical perspective. And uh, this is the perspective that I take um, in critiquing uh, or examining the, the, the judgment in uh, prosecutor versus Ongwen. Um, it is important at this juncture for me to mention that the Ongwen case is um, a, a sensitive case when one looks at the gravity of the crimes of which Ongwen was uh, convicted. So it is important for me to clarify or to mention at this stage that the arguments that I make in this paper are not in any way meant to downplay the gravity of the crimes of which Owen was convicted, uh, neither are they meant to uh, trivialize the pain and suffering of the victims. But uh, the, pro uh, the purpose of the paper is to make an innovation to the growing body of available literature on this landmark uh, case by bringing in um, a 12 perspective to the discussion um, on the relevant issues that came up during this case. So the prosecutor versus Ongwen case has actually been described as a trial of many uh, first because there were many precedents that were set. Um, the court had to deal with many issues that had never been considered before. And uh, this includes that um, it was the first time that a former ch child soldier was appearing before the court. It was the first time that the court was called upon to consider cultural and religious issues. It was also the first time that the ICC has considered the offense of forced pregnancy as a crime against humanity and a war crime. For the first time, the court also considered forced marriage as an independent crime, satisf satisfying the legal elements of other inhumane acts as provided for in Article 71K of the Rome Statute. The charges against Ongwen stem from the conflict in Northern Uganda between the Ugandan government and the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA of which uh, Ongwen was one of the top five commanders. So the conflict spanned uh, more than two decades starting from around uh, 1986 until the LRA was uh, driven out of Uganda around uh, 2006. Um, in 2003, in December, the Ugandan government made a self-referral of the situation to the ICC. This in itself was unprecedented because Uganda was the first to make a self-referral to the ICC. So PES went to this self-referral. The ICC then indicted the leader of the LRA, Joseph Kony, and uh, the other uh, four leaders together, they were known as uh, the control altar of the LRA. So the other indicted individuals were Vincent Oti, Okot Odiambo, Rascal Ikuya, and Dominic Ongwen. So um, as of today, Connie and Oti are still on the run. Odiambo and Ikuya have passed away. So following their deaths, the charges against them were uh, terminated. Ongwen surrendered to United States troops in the Central African Republic in January 2015. And um, this culminated to him being um, surrendered and turned to the ICC. In February 2015, his case was severed from that of the prosecutor versus Joseph Kony et al. The charges. So initially, Ongwen was charged with um, three crimes of three counts of crimes against humanity and four counts of war crimes, which were perpetrated in Northern Uganda's uh, Gulu district in an internally displaced persons camp known as uh, Lukodi. However, um, in September of 2015, the then prosecutor Fatou Ben Suda then indicated that uh, there would be additional charges. So when there was the decision on the confirmation of charges in 2016, uh, Ongwen was charged with a total of 70 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Of those 70 charges, trial chamber nine convicted him of 61 charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes in February, 2021. 
In May of 2021, Ongwen was sentenced to 25 years of imprisonment uh, pending appeal. So um, the defense team has appealed against both the verdict and the sentence. The appeal has been heard and um, it is anticipated that the appeals chamber will render a decision um, in December of 2022. The, the trial chamber divided into three categories, the charges which were faced by Ongwen. The first was that of crimes committed during attacks on four IDP camps and respect, in respect to these charges, Ongwen was charged under various wards of liability for crimes against humanity and war crimes. The specific crimes included murder, torture, sexual enslavement and pillaging, um, and the destruction of property. In respect to this category, Ongwen was also charged with um, political persecution on the basis that he committed these crimes um, pursuant to a perception that was shared within the LRA, a perception with, uh, which Ongwen also shared that uh, the civilians living in IGP camps in Northern Uganda were siding with the government in uh, the conflict between the government and the LRA and therefore they were perceived to be enemies. In the second category, Ongwen was charged with sexual and gender-based violence, SGBV crimes, directly perpetrated by himself against uh, seven women who at any given uh, time um, during the time relevant to the charges, that is between the 1st of July, 2002 and 31 December, 2005, these women were present in his household as his so-called wives. So the charges included forced marriages, uh, charged as inhumane act constituting crimes against humanity and forced pregnancy as a crime against humanity and a war crime. With respect to the final category of crimes, Owen was charged with crimes which are systemic in nature concerning SGBV crimes, which were committed in general against the women uh, who were living within the Sinai uh, Brigade um, of which Owen was a commander and also the conscription and use in hostilities of children under the age of 15. So with respect to this uh, category, Ongwen was charged with various modes of liability of crimes against humanity and war crimes. And the specific charges included forced marriage, sexual slavery, rape, and conscription of children under the age of 15. So um, there were a number of pertinent issues, as I have said, which uh, the chamber had to deal with. So the first one that I looked at in my paper is the fact that uh, Owen was a victim turned perpetrator. So his defense team raised the defense of mental incapacity on the basis that he was himself a victim of abuse by the LRA. So they argued that rather than treat Owen as a perpetrator, he should actually be taken as a victim. The defense experts testified that although Owen had physically transitioned from being a child to an adult. His mental age remained that of a child, and this was attributed to the trauma that he, has, he suffered when he was abducted on his way to school from his home um, as a young boy of about 10, and that uh, this abduction resulted in him being torn from the moral and cultural fabric of um, his family. Hence, Ongo knew of no other life um, than that of the violent way of life of uh, the ORA. Witnesses testified uh, to the effect that Ongwen was abducted uh, when he was um, a young boy. And um, although several of them attested to his age uh, when he was abducted into the exact year, the trial chamber deemed that the most reliable evidence was that which was um, adduced by his uncle, who said that Ongwen had been born in 1978 and then was abducted uh, in 1987. And uh, this was because um, of uh, the intimate knowledge that the uncle had with uh, respect to Ongwen's family. 
Nonetheless, the trial chamber reiterated that these dates were not relevant to the charges in question uh, because Owen was being charged for offenses that he committed as a fully responsible adult. So in terms of the Rome Statute, a child's innocent, uh, innocence is absolute. This is uh, with respect to Article 26 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So if someone um, commits a crime before they turn the age of uh, 18, they can absolutely not be brought before um, the International Criminal Court uh, with respect to those crimes. However, a distinction ought to be drawn to be drawn with child soldiers because uh, their status as victims falls away at the age of 15. So the chamber ruled with respect to this defense of uh, mental incapacity in that Ongun was himself a victim, that uh, he committed these crimes as a fully responsible adult, and that instead of uh, ensuring that others did not experience um, the abuses that he suffered as a child soldier, he went on to perpetrate the same crimes and that uh, his abduction did not uh, justify him committing crimes as an adult commander of uh, the LRA. So the defense had argued that uh, the fact that the prosecutor had actually acknowledged that Ongen had been portrayed as a victim and that uh, he um, had uh, possibly suffered a lot of trauma and then turning to say that um, this was not relevant amounted to a double standard. The chamber's apparent disregard for Ongwen's dual status has been criticized on the basis that although the, ought, the court ought to be commended for um, its efforts to adopt um, somewhat a victim-centered approach or more victim-friendly uh, approach, this approach when viewed specifically within the context of uh, former child soldiers carries the risk of diminishing the continued effects of the experiences of child soldiers. The court, um, in the case of Thomas Lubanga, went to great lengths to explain that uh, the trauma that uh, former child soldiers uh, face um, is actually um, lifelong. It doesn't, it cannot arguably be said that uh, it diminishes with the uh, passage of time. So in this vein, Issa has argued that Ongwen the victim cannot be severed from Ongwen the LRA commander because the behavior or the acts um, of Ongwen the adult commander of the LRA were arguably impacted upon by his experience as a child soldier abducted and abused by the LRA. And Peters and Kirabira have then argued that um, by just dismissing um, the experience of Ongwen as a child soldier and saying that the, 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 the date at which he was abducted does not matter, the chamber missed an opportunity to clarify this gray area of the impact of the dual status of Ongwen on the culpability for atrocities. And um, the former prosecutor of the ICC, Fatou Ben Suda, did say that uh, the phenomenon of child soldiers is not a rare one. Uh, it was not unique to the Ugandan situation. So what that means is that even though Ongwen was the first former child soldier to appear before the ICC, he is possibly not the last one. So this was an opportunity for the court to delve deeper into this issue of former child soldiers and the impact that their experiences uh, possibly has uh, on their behaviors as adults, uh, thereby creating all important jurisprudence for future cases. And also seeing that um, Africa is the ICC's biggest client, um, it was actually an opportunity for the court to clarify uh, this issue. The other issue which arose was that of cultural and religious defenses. So Owen, Owen's team raised the defense of Judas and submitted that Owen was at all times um, under the um, control of the leader of the LRA, Joseph Kony. So he acted under Judas uh, because he believed Kony to have mystical spiritual powers. 
this belief was uh, generally shared within the LRA. The members of the LRA believed that Connie's spiritual powers enabled him to foresee when uh, someone wanted to escape. So the consequences for um, attempting to escape were dire. They could range from severe beatings to execution. And one of Owen's uh, so-called uh, former wives testified to the effect that Owen tried to escape um, from the LRA in some time around 2003, but um, he was caught and then he was punished accordingly. So the defense was raising these issues in res response partly to what uh, the prosecutor had said, that Owen, when he became an adult, he could have chosen to escape, but instead he uh, continued to become part of the, um, to stay within the LRA, even becoming promoted to uh, one of his commanders. So the defense called several witnesses to testify as to how constricted soldiers were brainwashed into beliefs about Connie's spiritual powers. So this belief was so strong. And one of the witnesses testified that one of the reasons why people believed in these spiritual powers of Connie was that he um, was apparently able to predict future events, including the outbreak of the Ebola virus, Operation Iron Fist, and Owen's own trial before the ICC and all this came to pass. So this was actually uh, just to explain why was it that people um, were uh, believing that Connie had these supernatural powers. So the chamber then noted that it was not in dispute that Connie acted as a spiritual leader, but that however, former child soldiers had testified that as they grew older, they became uh, disillusioned with regards to um, these superpowers. And also the chamber repeatedly stated that uh, this testimony attesting to deep cultural norms and re religious beliefs of the actually and the LRA was irrelevant for present case. So they actually was the community from where Ongwen originated and it was not in dispute that the LRA spirituality was also embedded in the actually um, traditions and beliefs. So the chamber arguably failed to properly examine the subjective, cultural, and spiritual aspects of this defense of jurists and opted instead to rely on um, the evidentiary issues um, so one of the expert witnesses who was called by the defense, um, a professor who was at that time uh, a lecturer um, at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, uh, later argued that the chamber's resistance to properly examine uh, these cultural issues could be perceived as privileging uh, Western views. And uh, this supports my argument that I made that the chamber's um, approach could be seen as being Eurocentric. So of all the witnesses, uh, this um, Western scholar, Professor Christoph Titeka, was the only one who was cross-examined by the prosecution. And the prosecution, when dealing with the evidence of uh, Professor Titeka, referred to the courtroom as a forensic setting and apply, appealed to the laws of science, the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology in order to reach to an objective truth. But um, an understanding of African traditional religion shows that it is not concerned uh, with uh, science, with forensics, with physics, with biology, but uh, it is rooted in the beliefs of uh, the people in that uh, spiritual realm, which then um, in turn influences the behavior of uh, the people who share in that belief. So it's um, the apparent disregard of testimony by the Ugandan witnesses is arguably evidence that the chamber does not view these beliefs as being valid. And um, Professor Titeka then argued that the fact that he was the only one who was interviewed and yet uh, both himself and um, the Ugandan witnesses who had actually lived through um, the realities of uh, these uh, spiritual possessions uh, were saying the same thing, shows that uh, the prosecution viewed these um, Western views 
as being a bigger threat to its case than that of people uh, who had intimate knowledge of, 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 of the dynamics of these cultural norms which were being um, discussed. So at this point in, a, in my paper, I then draw an analogy uh, with, um, between uh, the approach of the chamber and the dynamic of difference and standard of civilization, uh, which was applied during the 19th century colonial confrontation. So the positivist jurists during the 19th century in their attempt to legitimize the colonial encounter, then uh, sought to draw a distinction between the so-called civilized European states and the so-called uncivilized uh, non-European communities. Uh, and on that basis, they denied them of statehood and sovereignty. And they said that uh, that was because they were uncivilized and that even where there was a semblance of civilization, this did not measure up to the standard that had been set by uh, the European states. And this standard of civilization was actually based on um, the cultural uh, norms. So on the basis of their culture, these non-European communities were deemed to be uncivilized. So I argue then that although this standard of civilization has become obsolete and all states are now uh, free to uh, participate in the international legal order as equal sovereigns, there is still evidence of a double standard which is applied along the former colonial lines. And I have given an example in my paper of uh, the ease with which um, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda was able to transfer cases to um, the domestic jurisdictions of France and the Netherlands and the rigorous process which was followed when it came to transferring cases uh, to Rwanda. Another example that I've given to show the Eurocentric nature of international law, uh, this time with specific reference to Owen's um, case is that uh, one of the defense witnesses uh, a doctor uh, testified that uh, when organ was requested for termites to eat uh, white ants which are found in Uganda and other parts of Africa he interpreted this uh, as a serious food request but uh, the prosecutor had actually um, interpreted this as, as a joke so I, I argue then that the chamber also arguably missed an opportunity here to um, holistically consider uh, the place of cultural and religious issues in international criminal law and uh, in cases um, before the court. And I have said before that Africa is the ISIS's uh, biggest um, client and this issue of spiritual uh, positions in warfare is not also uh, rare or unique to Uganda. In Zimbabwe, for example, during the second war of uh, liberation, um, the first Chimurenga rather, there were two spirit mediums, uh, Nehanda, Nyakaskana and Kaguri, who were also uh, considered to, um, to have mystical was to show that this, these issues are not unique to the ongoing case. So for the benefit of future uh, cases, it would have been um, commendable for the chamber to attempt to take a holistic approach to this issue. So another issue that arose was that of traditional justice mechanisms during sentencing proceedings of Ongwen's defense team requested the chamber to consider incorporating traditional justice mechanisms which were used in the Achami community in Northern Uganda. The prosecution said that it had no objection to this if that is what the, vi the victims wanted, but this could only happen after he had served the sentence or during uh, his sentence if the arrangements to that effect could be made. The counsel for the victims said that this uh, restorative justice um, approach was not provided for in the Rome Statute and that the victims were only prepared to engage with Ongwen if he showed um, remorse and after the reparations had been finalized. So the chamber then highlighted, and this was also highlighted by the prosecution, that in terms of section 23, 
the sentencing of a person who is uh, found guilty by the ICC is supposed to be done in terms of the Rome Statute. And um, then the, there are exhaustive options which are provided for in Article 76 of the statute, and these do not include um, traditional justice mechanisms. So in line with the principle of legality, the chamber said that it could not consider traditional justice mechanisms. And um, it um, alluded to the appeals chamber decision in the case of the prosecutor versus Jean-Pierre Bemba case, where the appeals chamber said that the trial chamber was limited to the options that are available to it um, in the Rome statute at the stage of sentencing. So uh, the chamber then emphasized that in making this ruling, it was not being insensitive to developed cultural norms. So admittedly, the arguments that were put forward by the victims um, council were also uh, valid because they actually say that uh, the, the, the victims were not only from the actually uh, community, but they were also from other ethnic groups within Northern Uganda. The prosecution also made a valid point as well as the chamber that um, these traditional justice mechanisms were not provided for in the Rome statute. However, the fact that the Rome statute makes no provision for traditional justice mechanisms then creates a gap in international criminal justice and um, resonates with the argument that international criminal law is Eurocentric. Traditional justice mechanisms are inherently relevant to African societies uh, emerging from conflict situations. And in recent years, they've been successfully implemented um, alongside the retributive system of um, courts. Um, so for example, a prime example is um, the Gachacha courts, which were utilized in Rwanda. There was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, but at the same time, there was also um, the Gachacha Court, which enabled the victims and um, the perpetrators to meet, uh, of course, within um, a community set up in the presence of a mediator and be able to uh, take steps towards finding closure. So in Northern Uganda, there are some people or local leaders who believe that Ongwen should have been subjected uh, also to um, transitional justice mechanisms. And there are arguments that have been raised to the effect that initially it was the state of Uganda that failed to protect Ongwen from ad abduction by um, the LRA. So Ongwen deserves to uh, then be brought before these traditional justice mechanisms. It would be beneficial for the victims then who long for holistic justice um, if the traditional justice mechanisms could be incorporated into the Rome Statute. This does not mean that um, impunity would be uh, promoted, no, but um, it is very uh, possible, I think, to for traditional justice mechanisms to be given a place and be incorporated within the Rome Statute. Um, the Rome Statute is not um, a treaty that is cast in stone. There is a possibility, there are procedures that are set up to the statute for possible amendment. And this happened before when the crime of aggression was added um, to the um, crimes with which fall within the jurisdiction of the court following the Kampala conference. So again, I argue that this was a missed opportunity for the chamber to properly um, look uh, at how traditional justice mechanisms uh, can play a part in international criminal law. Although there are these uh, missed opportunities that I have alluded to, there are also positives uh, positive strides that can be taken or that were made by the chamber. Um, in this case, the one that I have discussed in my paper um, is that of the conviction of Ongwen for forced marriage and uh, forced pregnancy. So forced pregnancy, sorry, forced marriage is not explicitly provided for in the Rome Statute, uh, but the court chose to interpret it as an independent crime, 
satisfying the elements of any other inhumane acts in accordance with Article 7 1K of the Rome Statute. So in doing this, the chamber then rejected the submission by the defense that a forced marriage is not an independent crime, but that it is encompassed by the crime of enslavement, rape, or sexual slavery. And the chamber said that because of the nature of forced marriages and um, the, the impact that it has on the victims, it ought to be taken as an independent crime. So this conviction uh, was a very important uh, milestone and it marked the evolution towards a victim-centered and gender sensitive approach by the ICC. Victims of forced marriages are often stigmatized when they try to reintegrate in their communities. And uh, in the case of Owen's victims, it has been reported that four of his so-called wives are now living together somewhere together with their children uh, because they failed to reintegrate. So they, they decided that they would become family to each other. And then as for forced pregnancy, the chamber explains that uh, forced pregnancy uh, is where there is the unlawful confinement of a forcibly made uh, pregnant woman with uh, the effect of depriving her of reproductive autonomy. So this um, refers to the woman's inability to choose whether or not uh, she wishes to become pregnant, uh, whether or not she wishes to have children at all, and if so, how many children she wants to have, and the spacing. So um, nothing is optional, everything is forced upon the woman. So it has been argued that uh, forced pregnancy um, is actually reproductive um, abuse. And um, so the conviction was with respect to two women for uh, three pregnancies. Um, Owen made um, his five other so-called wives pregnancy um, pregnant and they gave birth to 10 children collectively. However, these pregnancies were not um, included to the charges because the children born of these pregnancies were born outside the relevant time frame for the charges, which is uh, 1 July 2002 to 31 December uh, 2005. So Ongwen was charged with forced pregnancy as a crime against humanity and um, as a war crime. Forced pregnancy has been shown uh, to inflict further harm than other sexual crimes. Arguably, this is because of the trauma that is caused by the birth of, of a child or children from um, an unwanted pregnancy and the responsibilities that stem from an unplanned motherhood. So a woman is faced with uh, a lifelong responsibility of taking care of a child born from a forced pregnancy. So the modus operandi of uh, the LRA was that such uh, women, when they were pregnant, were kept under heavy guard um, and threatened that if they escaped, they would be killed. Both the children and their mothers face lifelong prejudices and stigmatization because uh, when they try to return back to their communities, these children born um, from forced pregnancies are then uh, perceived or seen as children of the enemy. That is why it is very difficult for them uh, to reintegrate into their communities. So Owen's conviction for forced pregnancies and forced marriages then highlights that the court has acknowledged the pain and suffering uh, of the victims. So uh, when Judge Smith was reading out the verdict, he read out the names of the victims as far as they were known to the court. And he said that these victims have a right not to be forgotten. And he also went to great lengths to explain the impact of these forced marriages and forced pregnancies uh, to um, the victims. The chamber has also made uh, an order for reparations for the victims uh, from the ICC's victim trust funds. So this order will be finalized if in December, the appeals chamber upholds the verdict. They have also been arguments, however, that uh, the, the scope for the forced pregnancy was not uh, broad enough on the basis that um, the commanders of the LRA 
were responsible for the distribution of these so-called wives who were then made pregnant. So there were arguments that um, the court should have broadened the scope of forced pregnancies to include those other women in the Sinai Brigade who were made pregnant by other commanders uh, and other LRA members because Owen was involved in the decisions as to which commander or which um, LRA fighter would get which girl or, or, or which uh, so-called wife. Uh, nonetheless, it is commendable that um, the chamber managed to um, convict um, and to recognize the crime of forced pregnancy as a separate crime and that of uh, forced marriages. So the conviction was the second one for SGBV crimes following that of Bosco and Taganda in 2019. An earlier conviction of John uh, Pierre Bemba was overturned on appeal, so it doesn't count as an um, SGBV uh, conviction. So in concluding, the prosecutor versus Dominic Ongwen case marked a significant turn in the history of ICL, uh, International Criminal Law, and in the history of the ICC, in that there were several unprecedented uh, complexities for the court to consider, thereby um, giving the court an opportunity to clarify uh, many so-called gray areas of the law, which arose um, during the course of this um, uh, case, and I must say that a number of scholars had correctly uh, predicted long before the trial started uh, which possible defenses were going um, to be raised by the defense and also even the issue of child soldiers had uh, been um, significantly discussed. Um, I think even Dr. Nokia wrote um, a paper on that. So it was a widely um, discussed case even before it came to trial. And that just shows how significant this case is to uh, international criminal law and to international law in general. So it has been asserted that for complex cases there, like the Ongwen case, other transitional justice alternatives and supplements, including national criminal courts, uh, truth and reconciliation commissions, and other non-Western local justice mechanisms could and should also be considered. As I said before, that does not mean that uh, uh, the, these arguments are promote, uh, um, advocating for the promotion of impunity because um, the argument is that they should exist alongside um, the, 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 the ICC system akin to what the prosecutor was arguing for that Owen can be sentenced then during the course of his sentence, arrangements can be made for him to undergo this uh, traditional justice mechanism. Also, um, experts who have commented on this case, including Professor Titeka, questioned whether in the first place, owing to the um, intrinsic cultural issues that arose um, that was the ICC uh, an appropriate forum for uh, Ongwen to be tried. If the ICC is to be a truly effective and universal mechanism of justice, it then ought to holistically consider the societal dimensions that are inherently relevant to the cases brought before it, particularly from the global South as opposed to uh, just looking at issues in black and white um, as uh, happened in the prosecutor versus uh, Dominic Ongwen case. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I will now hand over back to the moderator. Thank you so much, Dr. Mushariwa, for that excellent analysis of the Ongwen case that is uh, currently at the appeal stage, as you mentioned, and we are looking forward as researchers uh, at the developments day. But there's of course many missed opportunities here for the court and thank you for pointing them out. And we are excited to, to read that paper once it's published. So I think it would be good for us now to have a conversation and let's open it up to the floor. You can pose your comments in the chat box and or you can raise your hand and make any audio comment or question. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen.
I will also ask my colleague, Dr. Munyai, to assist me if there are any comments in the chat. So I can see two hands, but I'm struggling to see. Okay, yes, so it is uh, Brewster Suyapi and Are Nangolo. Uh, Nangolo, can you go first, please? And if you can just unmute yourself as well. You still on mute? Okay, Brewster, Shiapi, you can go because I think this is an issue of the audio. Uh, thank you, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Um, I've got about four quick questions. I don't know if I should ask all of them now or I can ask just one or two. Yes, but try to summarize or try to be as concise as possible, and then we, we can have a look at all of, all of them at, at one time. Okay, fantastic. So I should say at the start that I'm not very familiar with international criminal law. So I'm just playing devil's advocate at this point. Okay. So the first question is uh, in relation to the dual status, which uh, Doc mentioned was not included in the case itself. And my question is, would you, Doc, have been happier if, say, for example, the court would have simply mentioned that the fact that he was a former child soldier would be a mitigating factor in the sentencing in itself? Because I'm of the view that 25 years is, in fact, not enough. So perhaps it could have worked as a mitigating factor, but perhaps it had no bearing on the actual sentencing that happened. And the second question is, um, assuming that cultural norms had in fact been considered, what in your case would have been the ideal outcome in this case? Are you questioning the sentence or you're simply questioning the fact that cultural norms uh, were not being considered? And this borders into the next question as well, that considering that this is an international criminal court, right, as opposed to an African court, this idea that having traditional norms and cultural norms being included, would it not form a sort of dilution of what an international criminal court is? Because he is, a, he is an accused person of international crimes. And I would assume that international rules and international dimensions of criminality would be the order of the day. And the last part really that has to do with uh, the fact that you comment on the progressiveness of realizing um, forced marriage as a crime in itself. Again, this is devil's advocate. Would that not be double standards? Because if in the beginning you argued that there is a duality, a dual status which was disregarded, could you not say the same of the forced marriages argument that in fact it should not be a crime because he was a former child? I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Siapi. And I don't think we have the other person who asked the question back yet, but let us give an opportunity before I come to you, Michelle. Ms. Wellefield, before I come to you, let's have a round where Dr. Mishiriwa can ask, answer that question. Thanks, Dr. Mishiriwa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Doc. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I have written my, my questions here in the comment box. I don't know whether you would like me to to repeat it. Thanks, Mr. Wallafir. I'm just going to give Dr. Mushiriwa a chance to respond to the first um, question. All right, all right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Soyapi, for your questions. Okay, uh, I think I need to clarify some. My arguments uh, do, are not uh, meant to say that I. I, I am saying the court should have found Ongwen um, not guilty, no, but I was arguing for the chamber uh, discussing these issues at greater lengths and therefore uh, providing guidance for future um, cases. So you rightly say that uh, the dual status only serves as a mitigatory um as a mitigatory factor. So my argument is that this was a missed opportunity. It's not to say that um, the fact that he was a child soldier 
should uh, then have resulted in him being acquitted? No, because admittedly, the defense also failed to prove uh, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, what they were arguing that um, mental incapacity and all. But I would have wanted for the court to then uh, maybe uh, make a more detailed discussion of the impact or to acknowledge at least that uh, when a child soldier is abducted, this um, has an impact on their behavior as an adult. But this does not necessarily follow that he would then be acquitted. So I think you also asked whether I was questioning the sentence. I am not questioning the sentence, um, neither am I questioning uh, the conviction of Ongwen, but I am critiquing the court's approach, how they came to their decision, not the decision itself that uh, Ongwen is guilty of all these crimes. So because of that, I would not say that it is double standard for me to say that it was a missed opportunity for the court not to uh, take seriously the cultural issues that we raised arguably, and then to say that the court should be applauded for uh, convicting Ongwen of forced marriages because um, when you are critiquing a case, uh, you don't just look at the negatives, but you also look at the positives that you can draw from that case. So I am saying that although there were missed opportunities with respect to the conviction on forced marriages, and on forced pregnancies, this was a step forward in international criminal uh, law. I hope I have um, sufficiently answered you. Dr. CRP, is that fine? Yes, it's perfectly fine. I uh, would have just wanted to hear more on the last part, specifically the, the, the irony and, and uh, the fun part of having to consider um, the duality argument specifically for purposes of impregnation and forced marriages. Dr. Musharia, do you want to respond? Uh, okay. Um, please, uh, if you could just repeat that part of the question. I don't think I quite. Oh, okay, sorry. So, so again, the, the point I'm making is from a devil's advocate perspective, right, uh, as opposed to critiquing your version of it. So the argument being, would you not say, is it not a valid argument for someone to assume that if in the beginning you are arguing that the duality approach was disregarded in the whole sentencing, right, for his crimes against humanity, wouldn't you say that that's the same argument that could be used for the purposes of um, finding him not guilty on the purposes of um, forced marriages and getting these ladies pregnant. You could say that he's a victim of, um, he was a child soldier before. And because of that duality, perhaps he should not be found guilty. Because I assume that is one of the issues you were mentioning in the beginning, that that's an aspect that was not sufficiently captured in the whole process of sentencing and considering his conviction. Okay, thank you, I get now. Okay, so as I have said that um, I am not questioning the fact that Owen is guilty. There, are, there is overwhelming evidence to the fact that he did these things um, that uh, he was being convicted of. But um, um, when I talked about child soldiers, I was talking specifically with the fact that the court um, did not sort of bother to, to, to give um, a detailed explanation of the impact of child soldiering on um, the, the behavior of Ongwen as an adult. So even if they had given, uh, whether they had given a detailed uh, explanation or not, he'd still be found guilty. But a detailed explanation would then uh, work in favor of the court in that there would then be jurisprudence um, of the court, which would then be useful for future um, cases, because as I said, that this is a, a gray area, like an area where there is something that is lacking in terms of clarity. So the fact that Owen um, 
was a child soldier, as I have said, was not properly discussed, but still that does not follow that he is not guilty because as I've also said that the defense even failed to prove their case. But what was needed was an, an opportunity for the court to then go into great detail about child soldiers, about the role that uh, culture plays, and uh, to then say, okay, uh, in terms of the psychological effects, it is clear that uh, there is really uh, a case to be made that um, there is um, an impact on, on the behavior of an adult former child soldier. But however, the court was reiterating that it does not matter how old Ongwen was when he was abducted, or whether he was abducted in 1987 or 1988, because these charges are with respect to crimes which committed as an adult. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mushariwa. If I can also just come in here and mention that after I read some parts, because it's quite long, but some parts of the sentencing judgment of the ICC in this case, what was very important for this dual status assessment that they had to make, or that he's at least his lawyers argued for, is that it did play a huge role in the fact that the ICC prosecutor wanted to go for, 25, uh, for, for life in prison. But the court did say that because Onwen was a victim first, he's sentence then basically ended up to be 25 years imprisonment and not life imprisonment. So it did play a mitigating factor. I just wanted to mention that after I read the, the sentencing judgment, that was something that stood out for me as, as a acknowledgement of the ICC that this is still a, a very important factor, even though it's only a mitigating factor at sentencing. Okay, so we have a comment. Michelle, do you want to speak towards those comments or should I? Uh, yes, please. It's, it's really a question that I, I would like to receive uh, comments on. And that is international law requires a certain generality so that it's kind of a, an accepted view. Now, and that applies to trial approaches as well. If it's for the third world, it doesn't mean anything goes. There's a general regional approach then to international law. So I think what, what requires some critical analysis is that we need to look at African cultural practices through a critical lens, because there are some practices that do violate certain African accepted principles, uh, do violate certain um, accepted human rights. So the mere fact that there's a cultural practice uh, doesn't mean that there's a certain legality to it. Think of female genital mutilation, for instance. It's condoned culturally, but I don't think it is something that we should build into an African uh, or a third world approach to, um, to international law. So I think we need to look uh, uh, critically at the content of African approaches to international law. Um, my second comment question is the, um, if we look at the factors, how traumatized the child soldier was, how that uh, follows him into adult life, I want to ask, isn't that something that applies to child soldiers in general as traumatized people? People as people who cannot be reabsorbed into communities and so on and so forth. So the, the essence there is that not really going to the law and the, the, the protocol governing child soldiers. Isn't that that needs a revision and how it links up to, uh, to international criminal law? Thank you very much. And thank you, I must say, I really enjoyed it. And I'm so, so pleased to hear more research in this field um, uh, coming forward. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dr. Mushiriwa, respond. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I, 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 I take most of what you said as uh, constructive uh, feedback, which I will 
uh, use um, in developing my paper. Uh, but um, on the issue of child soldiers, I would say that this applies um, to all child soldiers. And as you rightly said, that uh, they find it difficult to reintegrate into uh, the community. So I think then we go back to the issue that uh, Dr. Nokia said that what was needed was the for the court to acknowledge to acknowledge that um, uh, uh, the, this uh, abduction of, of children to conscript them as child soldiers has an impact. Um, although that we cannot, because of the seriousness of these crimes, we cannot then say uh, Owen should have been found not guilty. But then the court's acknowledgement would be a very uh, significant um, development in international criminal law. And then um, I think on the, I, I'm trying to um, get the other, the cultural particularities. Uh, you write- uh, it, it's, it's, it's about the uh, trial in particular and that we, shouldn't use 12 to cover everything, but we still, it still needs a bit of critical analysis and like in international law where there can be a violation of a principle of international law, should we not expect the same within trial? So to uh, look critically at cultural practices that do violate, for instance, human rights. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, okay. I think I also need to sort of clarify. When I uh, argue about um, the court looking uh, in subjectively into the cultural practices, um, I do not purport to say that these uh, cultural practices um, do not violate, but then I look at it at the background of what was the impact what was the impact of this uh, cultural practice on uh, the, 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 the conduct of the soldiers? It is not in dispute that uh, these people were breaking the law um, and that they were violating international law by going to those uh, internally displaced people's camps and violating them. But um, like the arguments that I made for child soldiers, that... Um, the court had to acknowledge that this is the lived realities of the African people. We might not like it, but uh, Africans believe in witchcraft. They believe in spiritual possessions. Um, that was the argument. Not to say that it should be commended. It's just like uh, saying that um, people from a certain religion believe in a certain um, higher power or something, uh, it does not have to be, I don't know how to say, but um, that culture is there. It's, it's a reality for the African people. So just like with child soldiers, perhaps the court could also have made an acknowledgement that no, um, these people were believing that the, the Kony has spiritual powers um, instead of brushing it aside and saying, um, this is not relevant to the court. And I think that is why some scholars have been questioning whether the ICC to start with was the appropriate forum uh, to um, try on when considering all these issues, uh, because there are some issues that are understood better, if I may say, by someone who has intimate knowledge of those um, issues and is lived through the realities of those beliefs. But I do agree with you that a critical approach is needed. It does not mean that everything goes with 12, but I think that uh, where 12 is coming in is to say that when someone argues that there was a cultural dimension to a case, um, it should be taken as valid, not, um, not to be sort of trivialized. That is why I used that example of termites, that people do eat termites in Africa. So um, it's, it, it can be difficult to understand, but it's a valid reality. It's, it's something that happens. Um, thank you very much for your insights, Michelle. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mushriwa. I think let me also throw the cat amongst the pigeons, the ICC pigeons, and think of, let's think about also the effect of what Uganda did, because Uganda said, ICC, please help us. Please help us with this case. Please help us with the situation. It's bad. We are not going to prosecute ourselves, although we do see Koyelo being prosecuted at the ICD currently in, in Kampal, the International Crimes Division. We have Ugandan judges looking at the case. Now, my problem with this is that the fact that you have a judge, let's say, from Chile, Argentina, or Germany, wherever, they go sit there and they must now judge this case and listen to cultural, etc. They don't know a clue what's going on in African culture. So that's, I think, the criticism I have of the court. And of course, this is the only way we can have a court. The International Criminal Court is that you have judges from all over the place, but they don't know how the people in Africa live. So I, I just wanted your opinion on that. Because for me, Koyelo being prosecuted at the ICD currently, that makes sense. He was also a former child soldier, and he's also being prosecuted for the same similar crimes due to online. And that case, for those of you who don't know, is, is, is still ongoing at the ICD. Okay, thanks, Dr. Mushiriwa. Was that a question, Dr. Nakir, or you just making a comment? It's a comment, but I just wanted you to, uh, perhaps if you have any, maybe just thought on this. Uh, I mean, the fact that the ICC is adjudicating these cases that they are not qualified, I would say. It was a very good critique. It's a very oh. critical view, but they are not really qualified to, do, to know African. They don't know what's going on in Africa. Yes. But of course, Africa is, like you said, the most important client. <laughs> yes, I think that that is um, a very, very um, important observation. And what I've been trying to say that it has even been argued that when all is said and done, after we make all these arguments, can we say that uh, the ICC is the most um, suitable forum um, to, to try these people? Because as you see that it is very difficult to understand some of these dimensions that do come up uh, when you are looking at it from um, a, 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 a perception of, of someone who does not know of the lived realities. So because I've also done a lot of research of, um, on the African criminal court, the future African court on uh, of justice and um, women and people's rights, I think this makes for an argument that that is why Africa needs that court. Um, apart from uh, it being uh, of closer proximity to the victims, I think the African court would uh, be sort of more equipped <laughs> to deal with all these issues. That, that is what I, I am thinking, that the African court can be the answer to, to these issues. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mithriwa, and I, I agree with you, except, of course, the Malabo Protocol that uh, that establishes the, the African Criminal Court includes that very peculiar immunity provision that yeah, we, we all don't, not, not some of us don't, don't really like that. But I've, I think in, in, in this case, Coyello or Onwin could be prosecuted there because they're not the head of state. But well, of course, the head of state can still play a very important role, not an important role there. Then we have, I think, Prof E who is raising his hand. Prof, is that you? <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. It's indeed me, and um, it's I'm logging in from the uh, uh, link that was posted by my uh, students in the in our um, in our chat box on on, on our group WhatsApp for the master's program. I thank you, Dr. Uh, Musharua, for such an excellent presentation. Um, my comment and question uh, um, just to the first is to respond to the issues about twill. I, I, I think if we, um, from where twill is coming from and the way I see it is that we have to acknowledge that international law has it where is um, from its origin, is actually European customary law that was over time, over the centuries, uh, universalized. So 
um, what was essentially designed for European state has been universalized to other peoples across the world. So it would then seem strange and to, to, to say that um, the cultural peculiarity, uh, peculiarities that informed the development of that European common law uh, uh, um, cannot uh, 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 um, or should be accepted without a difference in, in other countries or in other uh, um, societies whose cultural beliefs are very, very different to, uh, to, 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 to European cultural practices that informs the way laws develop. That is one. The second point I also would uh, want to make is that um, from, from two perspective, for us as teachers of international law, the ongoing case presents a unique problem uh, and opportunity. Problem in the sense that if we go with how we continue to teach international law, um, how then do we explain uh, um, the re lived realities of African peoples on the one side and the uh, supposed international criminal justice uh, goals as it played out in the ongoing case uh, uh, on the other hand. Then the opportunity is in, in the ongoing case is for us to reconsider the pedagogy of international law, especially has practiced in African uh, law faculties. Um, the kind of materials we teach uh, in the spirit of decolonization now, we should, um, this is a plea to reconsider uh, those materials, especially in uh, international criminal law, as the ongoing case uh, clearly demonstrates that it is, uh, there's a disconnect between what international criminal justice aspirations are and what uh, uh, actually how it impacts uh, 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 um, the peoples whom it is supposed to serve in, in reality. And the intersection of, of culture and norms of international criminal justice as the ongoing case demonstrate is the failure of international law as it were to redeem itself of its colonial origin. And those, uh, um, uh, uh, those, I would say, drawbacks or historical uh, inadequacies of international law and especially international criminal law uh, is what uh, uh, the ongoing case also demonstrated. We find it in uh, colonial conquest, wars of colonial conquest, the issues of reparation for genocide as a result of colonial conquest. And uh, so I, I, this case highlights the need for us to then begin to uh, um, include more of these critical approaches uh, in our curriculum. Now, my question to Dr. Mushariwa is that you, you speak about um, Anthony Angie's dynamic of difference um, as an important uh, um, factor in understanding how international law uh, uh, treats peoples of the third world or as an instrument of continuous subordination and how these continuities continue to play out in Africa today. I'm asking what, um, what do you think or how do you think we should then uh, um, approach the reform of international criminal justice specifically, and of course, broadly international law, because as a system or as a legal order, it has to reform itself if it aspires to become more legitimate and more broadly accepted, especially in, in, in third world countries. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Uh Dr. Mishariwa, do you want to reply? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Prof, for your insightful comments. Um, as for your question, um, I think that um, what you said in your comments would really be the answer <laughs> to that question, because I think for international law to reform, it's, 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 it's quite a process for us to get um, to a point whereby uh, international law 
acknowledges that what is coming from Africa is valid, it is relevant. Um, and, and, and so I think it is a process that comes uh, from us, uh, from the grassroots, uh, how do we teach international law? Um, how do we publish? Um, the more we, we talk about these issues as, as African scholars, um, the more um, we are able to project an African voice um, to, 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 to the discourse, to the, to, to the discussion on, on whether or not um, international law is truly universal. Because I think the question that this takes us back to is how universal is uh, international criminal law and whose justice is this that we talk about? Uh, because from a European point of view, all these things about the culture can be deemed to be irrelevant. Um, but uh, those people who have gone through it, those people who have lived um, through the realities of these uh, cultural norms will be saying that uh, this is a significant thing. Uh, this is important. It ought to be discussed. So I think that it, it, it calls on us um, as, as researchers, as practitioners, as teachers of um, international criminal law and international law to engage uh, not only with ourselves, but also with, 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 with our counterparts from the global north and try to find um, middle ground so that at least we acknowledge that uh, both uh, the values from the west and from the global south um, are important and uh, yeah, as I said that, I think your comment prop also in a way answers the question that you asked um, at, at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishriwa, and, and for your brilliant presentation. And we have now reached, and, and all the comments by the participants and questions, thank you so much. We have now reached, before I close the meeting of the seminar, can you please give us a few closing remarks Prof. E. Thank you, Dr. Nokia, and thank you, Dr. Mushawa, and to the Zoom Professor Devu, and to uh, all the participants, um, uh, um, uh, everyone who took our time to join us today. Um, we will be continuing with our conversation and please watch the space. Uh, we have another seminar coming up um, sometime in, in October or November and uh, to be presented by another of our research fellow at the African Center for Transnational Criminal Justice. Um, the idea is to uh, continue to intellectually stimulate and enrich uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the faculty and the university uh, uh, at large. Um, I don't have any more uh, uh, than to all wish you a good afternoon. Thank you, and and Dr. Nokia, that's all from my side. Thank you so much, Prof. E, and thank you to the dean, all the participants, and to you, especially thanks to you, Dr. Mushariwa, for your presentation. This is now where I close the meeting, and I may have a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, colleagues, and bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.